you all. Okay. Thank you very much for doing the interview with us today. So let's get started. Okay. The first question is, you started your own company at 16 and you were also a consultant for Apple Bank U mm -hmm. and a civic hacker before you joined the cabinet. What have you brought to the job uh, from your previous experiences? Mm -hmm. And what do you hope to achieve as a digital minister? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bring with myself the culture of the internet society. Uh, on internet, because people seek rough consensus and running code. This is not a traditional representative democracy, but rather everybody with an email can participate with how internet works. And this idea of an internet that belongs to everybody uh, is very different from the traditional democracy where uh, most of the decision-making power and agenda-setting power are uh, centralized in a few representatives. So I bring with me the spirit uh, of open innovation. And what I try to achieve here is around uh, the three ideas, which is location independence, making sure that public servants can work anywhere, uh, is around voluntary association, meaning that people with a good idea can innovate anywhere from the society in order to contribute to public policy. Uh, and the third thing uh, is radical transparency. Every single interview like this one, uh, or the meeting that I chair, I publish either the video or the transcript after 10 days of co-editing to the entire internet. So everybody can see not only the what of policy, but also the why of policy making. Uh, Taiwan has been held as an example in containing the COVID-19 outbreak. Mm -hmm. In your view, how is Taiwan able to put it off and how has technology helped fight the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, we use the three principles of fast, fair and fun. Fast means that we responded last year, whereas more uh, jurisdictions responded only starting this year. Uh, because last year when Dr. Li Wenliang, the PRC whistleblower, shared that there's seven SARS cases uh, on social media, it immediately gets noticed by the Taiwan equivalent of Reddit or the PTT, uh, and that escalated to our uh, Center for Disease Control uh, within the same day. So starting the very next day, which is the first day of January, uh, we started screening uh, and doing health inspections for flights from Wuhan to Taiwan. So relying on collective intelligence and the fact that everybody with uh, a single call to the hotline 1922 uh, can feedback their idea into the daily uh, live press conference of the Central Epidemic Command Center, which we established in January even before we have the first confirmed case. Uh, everybody can learn about the epidemiology, the scientific why, not just the what, uh, of the policies around say, hand sanitation, mask use, and physical distancing. And because uh, mask use is so important, integral to our response, we we'll make sure that we use the National Health Insurance Card, which is a single payer system that covers more than 99.99% of the citizens and also residents. Uh, so everybody gets a ration mask and there's uh, pervasive mask use. And finally, uh, we work with the civil society people so that they can analyze where there's oversupply or undersupply of medical masks. Uh, and we can change our strategy, for example, working with 24-hour convenience stores to make sure that more than 90% of the population have access, uh, easy access to the medical mask for daily use. And finally, all those CECC measures get translated by their spokes dog, uh, the doji zong chai, the shiba dog, uh, that translate this into very easy to understand, easy to spread uh, memes so that people will voluntarily share the scientific knowledges and so that it would have a, a higher R value uh, than conspiracy theories and rumor, and that's called humor over rumor. So next question is, Taiwan is one of the most progressive societies in Asia and the region's first to legalize same-sex marriage last year. Do you think the battles have been won to make Taiwan more inclusive and equal, or one more should be done? Mm -hmm. So many more should be done. For example, um, I'm a transgender. At the moment, Taiwan have not yet recognized uh, domestic non-binary people, although we do uh, recognize foreign non-binary non people. Uh, when you uh, enter Taiwan and have to file your health declaration card, for example, there is a non-binary choice. Uh, but uh, we're still working on that, right? So there's many more to be done for LGBTIQ plus uh, people, uh, but I think Taiwan is firmly on the path of inclusion. So do you know the government is taking any in initiative to, to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we're uh, working on a new uh, national ID system 
uh, where the foreign people uh, with a resident certificate um, at the moment, uh, which looks very different because the second uh, digit is a letter, not a digit. So, uh, and the car looks different and everybody would say that, oh, even if you have a permanent resident certificate, you're not a domestic citizen with a national ID and so on. So we're working on making the environment uh, much more friendly to foreign people who consider uh, themselves to be also Taiwanese. That is to say, if they stay for more than five years, they can get the Taiwan nationality without relinquishing their original nationality. And so this kind of migration plan uh, would also apply if that person is non-binary. That is to say, if they start off uh, in a jurisdiction with a non-binary agenda. And uh, when that, uh, more of that uh, sort of people uh, begin to become also Taiwanese, uh, that would be the time that we have to face our own non-binary agenda system. So have you played a role in the progressive and reform policies that the government has been mm -hmm. implementing? Mm -hmm. exactly. mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, I have been consulted uh, on intergenerational solidarity issues because I'm not just in charge of the open government and social innovation, but also around youth engagement. Uh, and so for many people uh, who are under 18 years old, where they cannot even participate in the referenda, the online participation system is the only place that they can uh, participate meaningfully uh, in the democracy uh, here. So, for example, there was a reform uh, for our national identity drink. It's called the bubble tea. Maybe you have heard of it. Uh, and there's often a associated plastic straw. Uh, but a person uh, with the pseudonym, um, I love elephants and elephants love me, uh, proposed on the uh, platform of e-petition that we should ban uh, such a use of plastic single-use utensils because it's very easy for it to get into the rivers and the waterways and cause uh, marine debris. And that very quickly garnered uh, more than 5,000 signatures. And uh, I lead the uh, system of participatory officers where we meet every month to determine two cases to meet face to face with, say, the e petitioners. And when we meet her, uh, she's actually just 16 years old. And when we ask uh, why would she start such a uh, very popular petition, she says it's her civics class assignment. Uh, and so because of that, uh, we very quickly talked uh, various uh, options of circular design. For example, you can redesign the drink so it doesn't require a straw. Or you can make the straw out of, like literally, a straw, uh, which is zero or even negative uh, carbon footprint. Or you can use reusable glasses and so on. And so we paired uh, the petitioners with the makers of single-use utensils and ultimately, starting last year, start banning uh, such plastic one-time use straws for takeout drinks. Um, and so that's a really good example of a reform that's around environmental policy that started by someone who doesn't even have the voting right. You are Taiwan's youngest uh, cabinet minister and the only transgender minister in the world. The only openly transgender. Uh, uh, sorry, the only openly transgender <laughs> minister in the world. Do you get messages from people in Taiwan or abroad mm -hmm. saying you are their inspirations mm -hmm. or you are their role models? Do you reply to those mm -hmm. messages and did you give them any advice mm -hmm. about how transgender people might mm -hmm. enter politics? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think it's easier uh, for us because we don't have this binary thinking. We don't think that there is half of the world that's different from us. So it's easier for us to empathize with all sorts of different people because I personally have uh, went through two puberties. I have some shared sentiments, some shared lived in experiences, and I can also uh, empathize more with people who suffer uh, from the different minorities and so on. That's called intersectionality. And so I think uh, transgender people as with transcultural people, transdisciplined people, transnational people, and so on, have a natural advantage at politics because we're more able to take all the sides. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you think Taiwan has been um, inclusive towards transgender people or has their uh, Mm -hmm. Still, stereotyping and discrimination mm -hmm. remains. In the well, society. the national ID system still on the second digit. Uh, that is currently still binary for domestic citizens. So that's one part that I would like to see uh, improvement. But overall, I think uh, people are very tolerating of non-binary people and uh, actually understand my point of that uh, we are more able to empathize with more people. Mm -hmm. And the national ID system you were talking about mm -hmm. the. Um, the, the, the gender uh, mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. Is the government going mm -hmm. to 
to do work on that. Too. As I said, for uh, foreign people uh, who are um, getting a resident permit in Taiwan, uh, at the moment we're uh, allocating the digit seven uh, for non-binary people who migrate uh, from their foreign uh, passports with a non-binary field. As for domestic people, um, there's an idea uh, of using the letter um, zero as a digit, but also a letter O, oh, I guess. But anyway, to use the digit zero uh, as the second digit uh, in the national ID system. But that uh, would require regulatory adjustment, and I have not yet seen the draft. Mm -hmm. Do you expect it will happen in, in, this, in the next four years? Well, I think there is uh, popular support uh, for uh, respecting other jurisdictions, non-binary people. I think there's broad consensus on that. As of domestic ones, that requires a dialogue among the entire society. And going a little, uh, going back a little to the last question, do you give all advices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a favorite saying, um, there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in, is a Lena Cohen quote. So even though there may be many shortcomings, many injustices and so on, it also gives us a reason uh, to work together, to collaborate and to make society better. So President Tsai uh, started her second term uh, last month. Mm -hmm. You stay on the cabinet. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the priorities for the government in the next four years mm -hmm. and your priorities mm -hmm. as additional minister? Yeah, um, President Tsai said uh, in her inauguration speech uh, last time, in her first term, that before we think of democracy as a showdown of two opposing sides, but now democracy must become inclusive, become a conversation between many different sides. Uh, and that taking all the sides approach uh, proved to be very successful. Uh, during the pandemic, you can see that people with all party affiliations of all different coaches and so on, all worked very well together uh, to basically mobilize the whole society in order to counter the coronavirus. So we look forward to continue the sense of renewed solidarity to tackle not only the sustainable development goals uh, within Taiwan, but also share the Taiwan model of how we have, for example, uh, worked to resolve the pandemic with no lockdowns and also resolve the infodemic, the disinformation crisis, with no takedowns. And these uh, liberal democratic innovations is what we call Taiwan Can Help. And so bringing this message to international community and helping each epicenter of either pandemic or infodemic, uh, that is uh, a priority for us. And your priority as a digital minister, any special mm -hmm. task you are focusing on? Yeah, as a digital minister, um, at the moment, because I'm a horizontal minister, uh, I work with uh, all the different ministries, but I do not work for any particular ministry. Uh, but it is part of the uh, prison science uh, second term promise that we will look into a council or a ministry that specifically uh, works with digital issues. So uh, in the next uh, year or so, I'll help to formulate uh, the structure of that along with many of my colleagues. Yeah, like you said, President Tsai mentioned in her inauguration speech, uh, she's looking to create a new digital de development agency. So can you tell us a little more specifically mm -hmm. what the agency will be, uh, yeah. would you? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, it requires, uh, of course, a act being enacted by the legislators in order to set up such a digital um, development council or ministry. Uh, however, because I'm not a legislator, <laughs> I'm not at liberty of telling you what we'll end up become. But uh, according to President Tsai, it needs to, of course, at least uh, look at, for example, the um, digital governance. You need to look into uh, internet governance, multi-stakeholder dialogue. You need to look into, for example, cybersecurity uh, and things like that. But as of what the extent and the scope that uh, we'll have to get the legislature's approval and also cross-party consensus among all the four, actually five more parties within the parliament. So it's too early to say. Uh, as you're saying, uh, you are working with all the ministries. So I'm just curious: are do you do you work with the Mena Affairs Council, mm -hmm. and what's your take on the current mm -hmm. cross strait uh, relations mm -hmm. or tensions? If you can comment. Yeah, sure. So uh, we have many second mints, uh, that is to say, people who voluntarily join my office uh, from various different ministries. Um, uh, I heard that there's more than 10 people in foreign service uh, who want to join my office, but we only have one segment from each ministry at a time. 
Uh, so there's around like 12 uh, different secondments. So when there is a secondment, for example, from the Ministry of Culture, Interior, um, there was one from Finance, um, and he will return soon, Foreign Service, as I said, National Communication Commission, and so on, uh, Education, of course, uh, then we learn something about how they work, because uh, we uh, require that every segment to work out loud, meaning that uh, they need to share what they're working on with every other segment to this office. But at the moment, uh, the council that you uh, mentioned did not second anyone to my office, so I have no idea. Or do you have any of your own observation of the current uh, relations between Taiwan mm -hmm, and China? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you see any anything mm -hmm. or any mm -hmm. areas that can be improved? Well, I, I think the, during the pandemic, uh, we strengthened our democracy. Everybody feel that they are much more participatory uh, when it comes to, for example, fair distribution of mask of the. Um, good, uh, fun, humor-based uh, dissemination of scientific knowledge. People learn to be kind of amateur epidemiologists. Uh, and so the civil society, which is very robust to begin with, along with the journalistic community, which is very vibrant to begin with, gets even stronger during the pandemic, and everybody can, can see and feel that. Uh, whereas in the PRC, the journalistic community um, maybe is under uh, more constraint uh, in order to, for example, share the initial whistleblowing of Dr. Li Wenliang's messages. And so I think uh, during the pandemic, especially during the lockdown periods in uh, certain areas, I think the civil society, which is not very robust to begin with, uh, gets even more constraints uh, because of the top-down approach that they took uh, to counter the pandemic. So I think the pandemic served as an amplifier of the two different governing models that gets amplified on the two different ways. Do you think more people uh, from your unorthodox political background should enter politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people who look at politics as something that is mostly just the public servants performing uh, fixed um, duties, uh, that is a quite outdated view of politics. Nowadays, anyone with any innovation of how the society could be better can contribute to the everyday decision making. The old way was just because uh, with um, the old voting system, you can only upload maybe three bits of information every four years, that's called voting, right? Uh, to the public decision making. But now uh, with the internet, not only we can listen uh, to the politician uh, broadcasting like through radio and television, but through the internet, we can also listen to one another. So millions of people can now listen to one another much more effectively. So forming the collective intelligence with the right hashtag you don't need a representative representing you. You can just start a hashtag and have a real dialogue among everybody who's interested in that particular hashtag. So what I'm getting at is that we're now in an age where democracy itself is being democratized. Everybody can partake in public decision making and so in a way also become a politic uh, worker. So uh, Taiwan recently uh, just recalled the mayor of Kaohsiung City, mm -hmm. and some people, some media have mm -hmm. held it as a landmark in mm -hmm. democracy. Do you share mm -hmm. that? Well, mm -hmm. constitutionally, of course, there's always a strain of direct democracy uh, in the constitution of uh, Taiwan as a republic of citizens, uh, and so uh, a direct referenda uh, and recall. These are just. Um, directly specified in the Constitution as the basic civic rights. Uh, but it was uh, seldom um, exercised and seldom successfully exercised. So I think people learned more about the Constitution because of these recent developments. You have also been involving Taiwan's fight against disinformation. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of theory that most of the disinformation attacks might have originated mm -hmm. from China. What's your take? Mm -hmm. Has Taiwan been successful to ward off this mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. attack? Yeah, certainly uh, we face a lot of um, propaganda. It's not even uh, covert, it's overt uh, from various different um, narratives uh, around the world. But specifically, for example, uh, before our election, the presidential one, um, there was a concerted social media campaign that tried to paint uh, the anti-ELA protesters uh, in Hong Kong as people being paid uh, to, to riot and things like that. Of course, that's not true, but it's reusing a Reuters photo and just changing the caption 
so that uh, people uh, would think uh, falsely that these uh, young people are just being paid to, for example, hurt the police or things like that. And so in Taiwan, we work with the international fact-checking community. So the Taiwan Fact Check Center attributed that um, particular caption uh, to uh, the Weibo account of Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei, the central political and law unit of the PRC. And that Weibo account actually reused the Reuters photo, probably without paying a uh, copyright fee license, uh, and then uh, just changing the caption and uh, uh, try to, I guess, dissuade the Taiwanese uh, citizens from uh, showing sympathy uh, with people in Hong Kong. And so we face that quite routinely. And our way is called notice and public notice, uh, where the uh, Time Fact Check Center publicly say that this is just propaganda from the Weibo account. And uh, people who see it on social media uh, would see a line that links to the fact checking report so people understand that this is being sponsored by PRC. So do you do you expect or are you worried that uh, this information uh, would get more rampant in the, mm -hmm. in the future? Well, I think as long as people have good, um, just like hand sanitation rules, uh, people have good habits of thinking twice <laughs> before sharing uh, anything, of people uh, volunteering uh, into those fact-checking organizations, uh, people understanding that there is a narrative um, going on that tries to paint in particular ways. Uh, as long as people stay vigilant, uh, I have a lot of trust in the civil society of basically doing a public mental health <laughs> uh, protection of their own um, uh, media competence. And there's also lifelong learning and also K-12 curriculum that strengthens our resilience. And also from our administration, we make sure that as long as uh, we detect those uh, trending um, campaigns, we push out a funny vaccine, that is to say a, a humor over rumor, as I shared, uh, so that people who look at it and laugh at it uh, will remember that uh, there is a campaign going on and you don't have to uh, believe that, rather you can uh, check the source yourself as if you're a part-time journalist. Uh, there have been suspected cyber attacks on Taiwan's presidential office and some companies uh, recently. Is Taiwan getting more vulnerable to cyber attacks? And are these attacks part of some coordinated campaigns and some who? Um, the critical infrastructures in Taiwan have always been a target of cybersecurity attacks. This is not news. Uh, what is news, though, uh, is that we now have an um, act, the Cybersecurity Act, that says every uh, critical infrastructure, every government agency, and so on, have to have dedicated personnel uh, for cybersecurity. And I think uh, as important, if not more important than the personnel, is that for each new government project, now, 5 to 7 percent of the ICT budget now specifically goes to cybersecurity for penetration testing, for threat hunting, and for pervert saving and other cybersecurity measures. Uh, we're looking to expand that budget in the next four years so, so that it's now uh, 5 percent to 7 percent of the IT budget, but it may become 5 to 7 percent of the total budget, which is a lot more. Uh, and so we work with a white hat hacker community who do the penetration testing and tell us uh, how they have done it so that the defending team, the blue team, will learn from the creativity of the red team uh, that are white hat, meaning that they're responsible and ethical uh, hackers. And so this uh, culture is what we uh, are building uh, in Taiwan. And I think I look forward in the uh, next few years where we would have an even more vibrant cybersecurity industry than before. But for the more recent suspected attacks, do you see anything mm -hmm. unusual or any, mm -hmm. any, any moments? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think uh, what's interesting about the uh, recent news uh, is that what we have seen uh, from the individual um, events, uh, they may actually work with the, um, for example, journalistic community, like directly emailing uh, the journalist in order to form a certain narrative. And that is quite political in nature and not at all technical. Uh, and so this kind of political coordinated actions, of course, marks a difference uh, between the purely technical, like hijacking of computers and whatnot, uh, and so on. And so that, I think, is the main difference. Do you have any um, speculation who could mm -hmm. be behind mm -hmm. that? 
Um, so um, I'm in the administration and I'm not part of the president office uh, cybersecurity team or the national security council uh, counselor that work with uh, the presidential office. So I have nothing to comment on this. Sure. Okay. So uh, do you think um, uh, um, uh, some things should be done differently in President Tsai's uh, first term? Like for the government as a general, and for for you, do you see like looking back? Mm -hmm. Is there something you mean that retroactively? Should, re yeah, retroactively mm -hmm. uh, using something should mm -hmm. should have been done differently mm -hmm. to make it better, or mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. that you see should mm -hmm. be should be improved. Mm -hmm. Sure. That. So um, I think the uh, bundling of the referenda and the election uh, was a mistake, because when people look into the referendum ticket. It takes time for them to read and comprehend it. Uh, however, when you're voting for a particular candidate, people tend to get into this partisan thinking. So representative democracy and deliberative direct democracy on the same day, in the same voting booth, uh, is bound to leave uh, people feeling very polarized. And so that is why um, now we have uh, changed the laws. So it takes on alternating years it will be one year of the presidential election, and then the next year, referenda, and then the next year, mayoral election, and then the next year, referenda, and so on. Uh, but if we have started uh, with these on alternating yes, maybe there will be no um, the tension and polarization and so on that we saw in the uh, mayoral election plus referenda. Uh, that day would be different. And for, for yourself, for mm -hmm. your... For your for you as a digital minister, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, you, you wish you had mm -hmm. done differently. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, I, I think uh, what I have done is mostly just to build a space for people to arrive to common values despite their different positions. Uh, I think I have held that space quite well. I wish that um, I could introduce the Sustainable Development Goals sooner uh, because um, I started aligning my work with the SDGs. Uh, around 2016, late 2016, and only started publicly advocating Taiwan can help for the SDGs uh, starting 2017. But SDGs were already um, passed uh, in 2015, right? So it's a global goal that unites uh, all the different countries. So had I a uh, chance to go back in time, I would start aligning my work with the Sustainable Development Goals at the second that I entered the office instead of waiting for around half a year. You have previously described yourself as an anarchist. And conservative anarchist. Uh, conservative anarchist mm -hmm. and, and advocate conservative anarchism. Mm -hmm. Do you still see yourself that way after being with the government mm -hmm. uh, in the next four years? Yes, certainly. I'm working with the government. I'm working with the government, not for the government. I'm working with the people, not for the people. So I'm at this kind of Lagrange point between the social movements on one side and the government uh, on the other side. Uh, I'm not taking any particular side, I'm taking all the sides, but I'm trying to build, it's just a space, as I said, for a common purpose to grow and to find things that we can all live with, and I continue to hold that position. So you're still a conservative an of course. anarchist. Can, can you tell us, I know you've said that, but can, can you tell for this interview, what does that mean? Sure. So uh, to conserve is to respect uh, existing cultures, to be transcultural. That is to say, in Taiwan, we have more than 20 national languages, and each represent one or more languages of culture, from the Austronesian indigenous cultures to the waves of immigration, uh, including, of course, the internet culture of rough consensus and running code and so on. And so uh, instead of like a purely progressive um, development, which may uh, advance one of the cultures to the detriment of the others, we need to find innovation that take care of all the different culture to be uh, maximally inclusive. That's what conservative means to me. And anarchist means uh, to do no coercive action, to give no orders, to take no orders, but rather uh, work with voluntary um, association with all the different sides. And so that means that when I introduce new measures to reduce the risk uh, to reduce the chores of the everyday uh, time spent on bureaucracy uh, or to uh, improve the trust and credibility of the public sector, trusting the citizens more, uh, I make sure that there's no sacrifices made uh, to any of the ministries or stakeholders involved. Um, in uh, academic terms, I make only Pareto improvements, and that's what I mean by anarchism. 
So some Japanese media have dubbed you the genius item minister mm -hmm. with an IQ of mm -hmm. 180. That's uh, like centimeters. It? I'm sorry? The 180 is centimeters. Uh, yes. Uh, do you like that title? Mm -hmm. Or how do you like to be described? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm the digital minister, right? So IT, uh, while it empowers uh, digital, is not equivalent to digital. So I, I respect whatever moniker they use, but digital is really different from IT. And my job description uh, explains how exactly that's different. Uh, my job description goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, Let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. And the genius minister? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, just a, that's that? just a moniker, right? Mm -hmm. So if people use that, it's like a manga character. Uh, of course, like the uh, band Dos Monos, uh, sampled my voices into their hip hop songs while I did not uh, partake in their creation uh, because I relinquished the copyright of the interviews that I make. Uh, of course, uh, they can just take and remix it. So I see it as an interesting remix. But they get your consent to add No, I, I give the public consent to anybody, to okay. all the creators beforehand. Mm -hmm. So they did not specifically need my consent. So they did not contact you beforehand? Saying of course, before they publish, they mm -hmm. notified me. Uh, and I said, of course, it's a public um, license. So they don't have to notify me. But I'm happy, I guess, that they did it as a kind of courtesy. So you like how the way... I, I, I did listen to that, and it's re really interesting. So uh, is it like a one-time deal, or are you mm -hmm. hoping there could... It is not a deal, because yeah. I made myself oh, available yeah, sure. as material. Yeah. So any creator can freely remix the images and video and sound uh, that I made. And so in that sense, uh, I'm just enabling more creations, but I'm not really creating directly with them. But either as a hobby or, or like a similar, mm -hmm. a similar venture, mm -hmm. will you be mm -hmm. looking into more in, mm -hmm. into the music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, of course, I like music. <laughs> I listen to music. Uh, but at the uh, current point, I do not have time to do music making. I've read some reports that you go to KTV. Mm -hmm. You s you still have time to go to KTV. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, is that a, like mm -hmm. a continuing hobby for you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do uh, sing a lot, a lot. But it doesn't have to be uh, like institutional KTV. <laughs> it could be just uh, in my apartment or in a social innovation lab. But I do enjoy singing a lot. So uh, what do you do outside work? Do you mm -hmm. have any particular mm -hmm. hobbies or mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so I walk to the social innovation lab every morning uh, and I walk back uh, every day. And so I just uh, stop by uh, to chat with random people uh, because people would say hi to me and they would have something to share, maybe about their life, maybe about public policy and you know, things like that. So I enjoy talking to people uh, when uh, I'm on the way uh, on the work or uh, on my way off the work. So people actually stop you on the street and you respond? Yeah, and we just every have day? a chat. Yeah. Almost every day, yes. Sometimes they just want to uh, take a selfie together. That's fine too. And you never say no? Yeah, of course. Unless I'm in a rush, which I almost never work. So that's uh, like a almost like a daily routine? Yeah, it's for almost me. a daily routine. Can I ask how many people a day you encounter uh -huh. like this? Roughly? S roughly, uh, maybe two or three. Okay. Oh, interesting. Or is there anything, I think we're through with a list mm -hmm. of questions, so is there yeah. anything you want to add mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. emphasis? Or yeah, so for more about the Taiwan model to counter the pandemic, uh, just see TaiwanCanHelp.us. Okay, thank you.